my name is Clara Olson, and it is my great honor to be introducing Heather Oberge, who is a practicing architect and educator in Los Angeles. She received both her Bachelor of Science and Master of Architecture degrees at Ohio State University and went on to work for such offices as Eisenman Architects, Davis Brody Bond, and Architecture Research Office before starting New Form with her former partner, Jason Payne, and then her office, Murmur, in 2005. As you will see tonight, Heather's work spans a range of scales and programs from New Form's hazy, immersive PS1 entry to the modulated sensuality of Murmur's Bioform wall recently exhibited at Artist Space in New York City. Her design research, carried out in her practice and teaching, focuses on the translation of complex forms into geometries of matter by embracing the generative possibilities of digital and manufacturing tools. Adding to Rainer Banham's Four Ecologies of Los Angeles, Michael Speaks describes fabrication as the fifth ecology due to the prevalence of aerospace, automotive, and entertainment industries, their use of large-scale digital fabrication machines, and willingness to collaborate and share expertise. Heather, along with her former partner, Jason Payne, translated their or transplanted their practice new form to Los Angeles in 2002, seeking out industry and client partnerships that enabled deep material investigations and the production of new atmospheres. Her practice, Murmur, continues this line of research. Through a geeky, cool obsessiveness with constructability, Heather has developed a highly rigorous, effective body of work that is pushing the field through the generation of new forms and experiences. Although this material sensibility is characteristic of a small set of Los Angeles design firms, the special effects produced by the work are particular to her practice. The thickened, articulated surfaces, chromatic saturations, and tactile sensuality affect a mul multiplicity of sensations. Yet despite the all-at-once quality of many of her projects, her meticulous attention to material connections and embedded structural geometries allows the work to have an effortless ease of existence, a product-oriented, refined objectness. Sylvia Levin describes current architectural practice as having, quote, a new materialist thinking, and Heather's work is certainly of the now. Murmur's Vortex House project, situated high in the Malibu topography, has a breezy inside-outside quality that embodies the California modernist tradition, yet its geometric and material sensibilities are completely current. As stated before, the contemporaneity of her practice is also reflected in her teaching. As a student of Heather's at UCLA, I found her to be demanding, insightful, and encouraging. She teaches a rigorous yet playful approach to design, utilizing a highly controlled set of parameters. In Heather's fabrication seminars at UCLA, entitled Between the Sheets, Students produce tessellated surfaces that have been widely recognized for their innovative and delightful results. Several projects were published in Lisa Iwamoto's Digital Fabrications book, and the seminar work will also be included in the forthcoming book entitled Contemporary Plasticity that Heather is co-authoring with David Erdman and Jason Payne. In addition to teaching, Heather holds the positions of Associate, Associate Vice Chair of the Department of Architecture at UCLA, and she is also director of the undergraduate program in architectural studies. The work of New Form and Murmur has been published in such journals as Form Pioneering Design, A Plus U, The Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Architectural Record, Metropolis, Praxis, and 306090. She's received numerous accolades, including an AIA Design Award for No Good Television Reception in Los Angeles. Because of all the buzz, she's been lecturing throughout the country, and we're very pleased to have her here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Heather O'Bearish. Sorry, there are lots of um, controls up here. It makes it a little difficult to 
negotiate. Here we go. Um, okay. Okay, so um, months ago when I was asked to give a title to the lecture, I used a title for a research studio that I'm teaching now um, called The Synthetic Reel. And I thought that I would start the talk by trying to explain um, um, my kind of work, it's happening now, on this concept called the synthetic reel. And I think Claire did a good introduction in, in calling me the geeky, cool um, LA architect because the sort of cool part of the synthetic reel is the synthetic part, I would say, and the geeky part is the real part. And I am interested in working on both of those things at the same time and most interested in how their commingling produces effects, spatial effects and surface effects and materialities that um, we weren't able to do before we found tools that allowed us to merge this, um, the synthetic, which I'll describe in more detail, with the real. Um, so my design research is really most interested in working on the ordering systems that are interior to architecture, space, figure, surface, atmosphere, and material assembly as things like energy, gravity, and technology move through those systems. And the synthetic reel um, is a way of, is a way of getting at that concept. I'll start by illustrating it with two um, instances of game design. If one is, is just the still from um, a game probably 10 years old at this point called Super, Mario's Bro Super Mario Brothers. And as Mario moves through this environment, Mario jumps from block to block and moves at a constant um, speed. So there's no no visualization or influence of natural phenomenon on Mario's occupation of this game environment. This one um, called Loco Roco, which is a more recent game for um, the PSP, is a Japanese design game where the relationship of geometry to environment or bodies to environment is uh, much more material and much more real, despite the fact that all of this is constructed in the kind of synthetic space of a game. Um, then other examples of the kind of uh, potential of the, of the synthetic reel are shown here. One is in a, in a piece by a Los Angeles artist named Tim Hawkinson. The other is a building in Basel by Herzog and Dimeron. The one um, in the Tim Hawkinson piece, which is called a motor, there is a kind of um, contemporary, technologically um, uh, uh, motorized portrait. So at, the artist produces a self-portrait, but a self-portrait <laughs> that is um, particular because technology manipulates the self-portrait to produce a series of, of um, completely artificial expressions and um, um, facial conditions that are not possible in a real in the real muscle um, uh, environment of the face. So what's incredibly interesting about the piece is that as these um, different parts of the face are manipulated with, uh, with um, digital input, the facial expressions become um, uh, completely man-made and the audience in the gallery reacts to these various um, funny or sublime or kind of grotesque facial expressions. In the Herzog and Demeron piece, the invention, the kind of synthetic invention, is the assembly, the, uh, 
a technique for assembling glass panels across a facade and across a building massing that otherwise seems to be incredibly conventional and to um, respect the kinds of uh, zoning and traditions of Basel, which um, are quite um, uh, tightly described as evidenced by what is a really uh, homogenous uh, urban fabric. And so with a simple invention of allowing a connection mechanism which um, uh, relocates glass planes, Herzog and Dimeron are able to present a facade which is remaking the fabric of Basel in the reflections you read in the facade. So both of these are examples of the way in which the synthetic, um, in one case, technological um, actuators, in the other, a material assembly, mix with actual, um, um, uh, actual photographs or actual material systems to produce these um, side effects that are only possible through um, these inventions. Um, and a kind of very contemporary example of that kind of work is in James Cameron's Avatar. And I'm going to give it a glowing review from the perspective of the synthetic reel and leave behind everything like its writing and storyline. Um, but in Cameron's avatar, our world undergoes a rapid evolution and the forms of life and environments we know shift through very strange hybridizations made possible only through um, the, the marriage of advanced digital effects, the kind of synthetic, with things that we know or have come to know. So the materialities associated with deep sea life and its aqueous environment combine with lush and supersized um, tropical forest and its kind of damp and moisture saturated environment to produce an unfamiliar and, and yet, um, you know, some wholly um, sensible uh, biome. The effect is uncanny. So your, our minds are activated by, the fascinate, by a fascination with this experience. You can feel the fluttering surface, experience the clinging heavy air, or um, move through the bodies of water by, um, by a kind of haptic experience of that which we see. So um, for me, that's the, cin that's the cinematic equivalent of the cinematic reel. Um, and I think that as designers, um, with the technologies we have available, we have the ability to transform materials into other materialities and produce um, um, environments that can shift phase state and produce different atmospheres that we haven't yet associated with architecture. So I'm going to flip really quickly through some older new form work done in collaboration um, with Jason to show you the ways in which um, we um, merged the synthetic and the real. In this particular project called the Man of War, the synthetic was the design um, was the design tool that we used, which was a particle animator. The real was an actual material that that had the qualities of some of these particle um, generators. And the the project is then a kind of um, you know, suspended somewhere between those two um, conditions. It's like a three-dimensional drawing kind of um, floating in space. And at the same time, it has a certain tactility. It's monofilament. It's 18,000 um, strands of monofilament suspended from um, a, a fishing net that's weighted and hung in a space as part of an exhibition. And that kind of um, work on geometry, distributions of geometry as a kind of synthetic act, 
you can see in a proposal for the Queen's Museum of Art, um, which had a kind of temporary exhibition basin, which is then developed um, and refined with a structural system that produces a kind of atmosphere in the existing building below. And this is a, a development model of the merging of the um, surface that is pro, a programmatic stepped surface for the museum and a structural system. And so we are really working very actively on, um, on the line work that is produced by the structural system and its relationship to um, this basin that we've programmed. And then um, another project which, um, uh, which I wanted to just show briefly is the D Cafe at UCLA. This was a design build project with students where the kind of um, synthetic um, aspect is to decide that the surface of the wall is never um, more than an 18 inch strip. And then working on that 18 inch ribbon of felt as a kind of material system, a series of rhythmic surface effects and acoustic treatments are produced for the wall and ceiling of the space. And then um, for, uh, to show a fully kind of fleshed out proposal that Jason and I did together, I thought I would show you before moving to s sort of more commissioned projects, um, our proposal for the Young Architects Program, um, the PS1 um, summer <coughs> installation at um, PS1's museum in Queens. So the project is called Purple Haze. It's named for Jimi Hendrix's 1967 classic, Purple Haze. And our project, like that song, aims to create altered sensory states similar to those suggested by his lyrics. Primarily corporeal rather than conceptual, the proposal produces altered states with vast fields of potent color combined with optical, tactile, and auditory effects. Um, purple haze is a sandwich of sensory stimuli compressed so that one, each one commingles with the other in a distinctly um, synthetic way. Colors and sounds are felt, physical sensations seen, and um, the multivalent atmosphere stimulates the individual and by extension the body of the crowd. So purple haze is stratified into the layers you see here. Um, the First, the lowest level at the bottom of the screen is a series of, of toroidal loungers. They're constructed of pliant green-tinted PVC tubing over plywood ribs for visual and physical softness. In the middle of each of these loungers is a wading pool, which is fed with um, water that's circulated for visual and auditory reasons, and lighting, which um, is a system that illuminates a canopy above. Um, these uh, pools were designed so that the, um, each of these 18 foot diameter units can accommodate a variety of, of crowd densities and also a variety of ergonomic configurations. So from seating to lounging, um, the section of the, of the lounger changes to accommodate the body. Um, and then another system that we deployed was an artificial climate um, system. We had, um, this is kind of um, inspired the name Purple Haze, but there's a series of distributions of water from um, kind of heavy particles in the form of fog to mist, to rain in one of the galleries. And those climates are meant to kind of densify the atmosphere that, that occurs between the continuous canopy and the ground plane. So the canopy above is suspended from a series of, of suspension cables. The fabric, because 
you know, we are pretty aware by this time of the limits of digital fabrication. The um, canopy is, is form found. So a series of rib ribbons suspend from cables and that allows us not to have to mold the canopy, but to get a kind of undulating underside to the canopy with really limited means. Um, this is an example of the canopy. So the canopy spreads out through two galleries um, and it pinches through this doorway. And the um, canopy is made out of, a, out of vinyl fabric that's perforated in relation to the lounging, the lounge system underneath it. So we have large perforations wherever people are dancing and moving about and small or no perforations in places where people rest on the loungers. And so that allows light to be activated as it moves through the canopy. And the kind of side effect of that is a series of sunspots that move around on the canopy below. Um, and the canopy um, also, in order to um, create the uh, kind of dynamic environment that um, where the surfaces aren't static. We allowed the fabric to, um, when it was perforated, to dangle into the space below. So when breezes move through the space, these untrimmed uh, flaps of fabric start to flutter and sway in the, um, at the canopy. And then these are just a series of drawings, trying section drawings, trying to um, show these various systems from the kind of climate system to the canopy to the loungers and the impact those have in the compressed section of the museum. And when we presented the project to the jury, we presented it by, by really framing the different senses that the project um, activated from the visual to the auditory to the tactile and all of the kind of local decisions about um, material and the um, interface of water and material were, were selected in order to heighten the impact that had on a particular sense. And then um, these are just a series of diagrams that sort of um, in an kind of post-analytical way, look at the way crowds um, are, are moved about and organized in relation to, the, to our, design, um, our design proposal and also the ways in which um, the particular loungers interface with the existing conditions, et cetera. And then this is the um, sort of final scheme where, or the, our kind of final rendering where you see the impact of the sunspots, the canopy, the loungers, and the crowd in that environment. So, so now I need to switch to a different. I need help. The crest on is dark. I need to pull up a different PowerPoint. So here I can do it from there, I think. Okay. How did you get it to turn back on? Um, just touch the screen. Okay. Um, oh, I know what I need to do. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, that project um, was the, really the last moment where um, my partner and I were collaborating. And there is, I'm going to show a sort of transitional project, a project that we began together and that I um, completed. And then um, another project I've been working on in my office, Murmur. And um, it's a sort of strange thing to present, but I have one client, one site, and two design proposals for a house in Malibu. Um, the site is on the bluffs above the PCH overlooking the ocean. And um, 
The site is somewhere near where you say t you see 21877 Azerly, and it's a, pl a flat plateau that sort of made somewhere about a thousand feet above the Pacific, and the mountains continue to climb behind that site. So the Pacific, um, the site is at the left side of this screen, and you see 200 degrees of ocean, and then you can see the way the section of the landscape continues to rise um, behind you. Um, so those are views of the site. And the proposal that Jason and I um, uh, started for this particular client is this one. This is a, um, a project that we call the Malibu House. It's a two-story scheme for this particular um, client, which is understood as a kind of um, a house in the round, which is something that allows you to see the landscape from 360 degrees. And that the house really is, was developed uh, for what is an excessively regulated site. It's a site that is only able to be redeveloped because there was a house on this site in the early 90s that burnt down in a wildfire. And so legally, geometrically, the site is relatively easy to develop because it's a, has a flat building pad, but legally it's incredibly constrained. So it's located at the edge of a major landslide zone and in the path of frequent wildfires. And there are numerous agencies that have competing, um, um, competing <coughs> and um, restrictions on the development of the site. So the project's form, structure, and skin respond in large part to the, this, um, these various constraints. So the house is lim was limited by the planning bodies to the area, height, volume, and weight of a former house. And um, the house much, must nevertheless meet building, current building standards. So the way we began was to think of the project really as a kind of um, organism that would evolve under the pressures of, of these various uh, legal forces. And we started the um, proposal with a really simple geometric um, conceit, that of a Klein bottle. And so because we were able to develop interior and exterior spaces, we wanted to find a geometric model that through kind of one volume was able to describe outdoor and indoor spaces. So we used the Klein bottle as a method for um, involuting and pulling into the interior exterior spaces while using only one uh, volumetric container. And these are some early studies of how the massing of the project might, um, might work. Um, the north is up on the page. The, the proposal that you see there is, is um, takes the Klein bottle diagram and it basically organizes all of the functions of the house in a tour in inside a torus. So in the middle of the house is a courtyard space and then the programmatic spaces wrap around that torus. And this is kind of our, you know, our schematic design diagram for how that house um, would develop. And to give you some kind of context contextual um, information, the front of the house where the torus is low is, um, is um, the living room with the view to the south toward the ocean. In the back of the house is the two-story portion of the house and by modulating the massing this way you're able to see the ocean from both halves of the torus. And um, in order to manage um, entry into this round shape, the torus is sliced, and so you're able to enter under the bottom of the torus um, when the torus lifts up off the ground. And when I show you the final model, those things will be a bit clearer. Um, so one of the big problems of dealing with a 
geometric form as complicated as this one is that um, you know many of our systems, our architectural systems, are not made to deal with double curvature. So finding a structural system and a cladding assembly that was able to manage double curvature was, um, was one of the kind of lengthy research components of the scheme. So these are a series of structural diagrams that we went through um, looking for a solution to the structural logic of the scheme. So we tried um, grid shells and we tried two-way rib systems and we thought about a monocoque um, system and in the end and this one's a kind of hybrid system. It's um, got a series of kind of gothic um, arches that connect to the floor plate so it makes a kind of roof with a structured floor plate in the middle. And what we found was that we really had to um, develop a structural system that was, was sufficiently supple in order to deal with a variety of load conditions in the house. So to clarify the way the floor plate works, um, you can see in, in drawing three on the lower left that there's one floor plate that spirals up to become the second floor and then a shell that wraps around that entire um, floor plate. So we both, we have, a sh we have a shell with a floor plate at the bottom and we have a shell that needs to um, structure a floor plate somewhere in um, mid-span in the height of the shell. Here is a floor plan which shows you how the program is distributed. You come in through a courtyard, number five, into the living room and you can go up to a master suite um, from the living room or into outdoor dining and a kitchen. Um, there's the floor, detail of the floor plate. And then once you're up at the second level, you arrive at the top of the stair and you can either go into the master suite or switch back and go onto a roof terrace um, which has views of the ocean beyond. So this is a, you know, an early diagram of the shell of the project removed from the programmed floor plate. So um, to me, one of the most interesting things is the development of the um, structural system. The shell is um, a series of 39 contoured steel plates and you can see that in number one. These are um, 5 8 inch steel plates that are plasma cut um, using digital control to describe a, a set of constantly changing profiles which describe the space of the house. In number two are a series of timber laterals and these are things that take what are really sort of paper thin steel ribs and um, keep them at a certain distance apart from one another. In number three are a series of timber diagonals which um, give sheer resistance and stiffness to that shell. And then number four is, is a kind of transparent overlay of the skin and a series of apertures that make its way around the shell. And so um, because, each, because the structural system starts with a series of, of profiles, kind of sectional profiles, we're able to modulate each of those profiles in relation to what that profile needs to do um, spatially and structurally. So you'll see in the upper left-hand side of this array of profiles, the floor you, you see the rib kind of track across the space and that's because that rib is holding a floor, the second floor at that point. And then in other places, like in the second line from the bottom, you see how the need for moving across the top of the shell starts to flatten and imprint the profiles with occupation. Um, this is the roof plan of that scheme and it shows the kind of radial array of those profiles in plan and um, this, the series of laterals that 
that um, make that shell rigid. And so um, t one of the things I found quite interesting about the system is that with slight modifications, the system's able to perform different structural roles. So um, the, the basic system is really most like number three. The profile of the rib describes a space underneath it. Um, but, and in that case, the floor plate just kind of pinches the bottom of the ribs together to keep the shell from, um, from splaying out at its base. In other instances, like at the stair, the floor plate becomes a kind of structural um, surface that spans from the first floor to the second floor, and the ribs merely sit on top of that to describe space. And then in number two, where the ribs are supporting the second floor, these very thin ribs are welded with flanges so that they're more like columnar sections and are capable of holding up the second floor. So if you look at number one, this is an example of number one where the stair, um, the floor plate becomes stair and spirals up to the second level. Um, this is number two where the ribs um, produce wide flange sections across to support the second floor. And then in number three is an area where occupation on top of the shell is, um, impacts the shape of the profile from above. So this is a structural model that I produced in order to really test this structural assembly and see how the parts behaved as we tried to erect them in space. And so um, this is, a, a way of understanding the form three-dimensionally just by moving around the torus. And then um, mm -hmm. the roof plan again, um, the roof deck, and this is the underside of the living room. And um, another interesting um, uh, sort of side effect of the structural system is that um, the windows, because this, the, there's a, quite a fre frequent um, rhythm of structure in the shell, the window system, um, coordinating the window system with that shell was a challenge. And in this particular case, all of the, most of the windows, with the exception of the main living room uh, window, are a series of 24 inch perforations, they're circular, and they um, kind of track and index the flow of load across the shell because they only exist in the spaces where load isn't. So instead of developing headers and cutting windows wherever we want, the windows actually um, are cascading over the form in the same way the forces do. And, there were, and our atmospheric intention behind that was to um, produce kind of lighting effects like this um, in a bath in Turkey. So these are some of the elevations of the scheme showing the diagonal arrays of these circular perforations and some interior vignettes showing how those windows sort of accentuate the surface moving from wall to ceiling and back into the interior of the torus. Um, and then in, in terms of the cladding system, which was probably the um, least developed system, um, we were looking for a way to shingle the project so that we, wouldn't, we would be working with a very small scale cladding unit that didn't need to be um, curved and instead would be um, a 12 inch shingle that could be um, arrayed in horizontal bands across what are um, a variety of surface areas that occur around the torus. So this is one of the more complex parts of the building um, envelope and we were looking for kind of darting methods um, to remove strips of shingle or add them in in response to the 
changing surface area that occurred around this shell. And um, we also used three different scales of shingle, trying to locate shingles where the path of rainwater would go. Um, and using smaller scale shingles where water would converge so that we could sort of accentuate and emphasize the corroding of copper over time um, in the particular spaces, um, you know, in the runoff zones that the shell would produce. Um, the other thing that's um, pretty clear um, in the sections and in the roof plan is that there is the double curvature of the surfaces, especially at the roof, are happening in two directions. So at a very, at a kind of um, intermediate scale, the shape of the house helps to reduce the thickness of the wall and the um, spaces are conditioned by this kind of pillowing that happens in the geometry of the, of the shell. And these are some other sections. The lower one is through the roof deck and the master bed, um, the top of the stair going to the master bedroom. The upper is through the living room. So that's um, the first house that was completed um, uh, with my partner. And this, that particular project, um, I'm not sure it's going to take me back. Oh, good. Um, that particular house, because the, the legal condition of the site's development was really uh, complex and multi-headed, one of the agencies in charge of, of exercising discretion and the approval of things decided they really didn't like that house. And um, I think they didn't like the house primarily because um, it was uh, entirely different from the house that had been there before and they really wanted the exemption to the code to produce something that was like what had happened before. So. Um, they gave us other reasons for rejecting that project, but the, the um, primary constraint that was added af after trying to permit that project was that the project needed to be a one-story project, and the height limit was going to be 60% um, of the height limit it was before. So the kind of bounding box of, of design constraints was cranked down and um, as a result, this is a project that's um, about to begin construction for this particular site. This one um, it, I call the Vortex House. It has um, some um, design overlap with the other scheme organizationally. So there are certain things like a courtyard space, a multi-sided massing, which produces extra surface area um, when you have a view. There are certain kind of um, overlaps with the other scheme, though the geometric language is quite different. And in this case, the project's ambition, um, conceptual ambition is also different. So the project's ambition lies in its dramatic spatial modulation and the saturation of its interior with the visual and geometric material of the surrounding site. Um, rather than understand the views as a way to release the interior to the exterior, the surrounding geometric and topographic features are drawn into the interior to condition its atmosphere. Artificial and natural geometries are characterized as of the same fluid medium and the house of vortex into which this material is drawn. So um, this ambition shapes all parts of the house's organization. You can see at the bottom a series of formal diagrams which basically take a courtyard um, type and by manipulating its edges in relation to context conditions like a really dominant ridge line, a 200 degree Pacific view or a canyon view, that massing becomes a five-sided massing 
and the exterior spaces that occur um, within that mass scene are distributed. And here you can see a sort of unrolled set of elevations of the house in relation to the natural geometries that characterize the rugged ter terrain that surrounds the house. And below at the bottom is a diagram um, titled Combined Geometries. And that's looking at the interior walls of the house um, through apertures that are made on the surfaces of the house to the landscape beyond. And um, this is a diagram or an image of a Lautner house in Mexico, the Arango house, which um, um, has some similarities, but, but also some radical differences to our proposal. In this particular house, the surveying of the landscape occurs at an upper level under this kind of rounded roof plane, and the house is tucked under this upper terrace. So the house is something that exists underneath what is a modulated landscape condition. Um, and here you can see the stratification of house under roof terrace, under canopy. And in this particular case, there is a modulated roof plane um, under which uh, the residence, residential program gets distributed. And the um, roof plane is structured such that when you're in the interior environment of the house, you are um, experiencing the rise and fall of the roof plane. So this is a view from the northwest of the site with the ocean beyond. Um, this is a view from the northeast of the site. You enter on the back side of the house um, and you circulate around an interior courtyard. So the plan, you can see here, north is up, so you slide under the plane of the roof and into a living and kitchen area, or you wrap around the courtyard to a series of um, bedrooms and bathrooms. Number five is an exterior courtyard that's underneath the roof of the project. And down at the bottom is a series um, of diagrams showing you the way the space of the house is modulated by the folded roof plane above. Um, this is a view of the house from the southwest. And um, this is just a, a kind of climactic diagram of the way in which airflow is also mo um, is, uh, manipulated through the five-sided building mass. Um, and then a series of elevations of the project. In some cases, you can see the kind of dominant ridge lines of the landscape beyond. And the aperture um, is really following a very simple system of using a series of horizontal windows that have rakes at their heads or sills in order to accommodate doors. And what happens is the geometry, the sort of outlines of the aperture are one more place which helps to mingle the kind of natural geometries of the landscape with the, with the man-made geometries of the house. Um, this is a west elevation and a physical model which shows you just the kind of abstract mass scene of the project. Um, and then again, a lot like the um, earlier version of the Malibu house, there, I'm quite interested in, um, in structural solutions because any novel distribution of space is going to require a novel distribution of structure. It's just kind of the way it works. Um, and in this particular project, there, is, um, there are two structural systems that are kind of cohabitating. One is really a basic timber framed system. The other is a steel tube frame. And so um, at the wall, the timber system and the steel system are in the same plane. And at the roof, those two systems are layered on top of one another. So you can see in this section, in order to accommodate 
the spatial modulation that's desired under the roof. The frame is folded. It's completely triangulated, so it's rigid and is really good for a seismic environment like this. And then the timber joists are set on top of that. And so in the context of uh, residential construction with a residential contractor, the fact that those two systems split at the most complex geometric moment of the house allows us to be able to manage the tolerances of constructing that plane. Um, here are two, and here you can see that's the, the steel frame pulled out of the massing of the house. Um, you can see all of the surfaces of the house below. One thing that's really important is that every room has two faces of exposure to the landscape and so that means at least on two edges of any room you're seeing um, uh, these sorts of views are pulled into the interior so this one is from the living room this one's looking through the patio um, out to the east and also through the front door to the to the rising mountains behind and that's the sort of final image of um, the entry again. So, um, so the last thing that I wanted to show was some um, teaching research that um, is also working on um, the synthetic reel through a concept that um, that I've tried to describe in, in some writing as synthetic materiality. And um, one thing that I think is, I described in Cameron's, um, in the description of Cameron's avatar, is the capacity of, the, of technology to manipulate real conditions so that we produce what are um, these kind of synthetic real conditions. And here are, you know, just a series of Los Angeles um, design projects that use the technologies that run across the top of this screen to produce different material conditions. Um, and one of the, let's see, one of the ways in which we, I've explored this is through a, a teaching of a course called Between the Sheets that Claire described. So I'll show you that um, class, the work of that class last. Let's see, I can't see this again, there we go. Okay, um, so the course thesis is that material reality has become plastic. Technology of design and technology of manufacture alters materiality, breeding what can be called synthetic materiality. This is a constructed set of surface effects resulting from the mixture of actual material properties and the geometry induced properties of digital operations. Um, in the most captivating mixtures, the real and the virtual become so intertwined that one perceives um, new synthetic materialities. And the optical and tactile sensations produced by these surfaces brings a new lushness to design research. So um, the course, it, and this is maybe as much for teachers as it is for students, but the course, one of the, um, the course is a little bit of a critique of the use of technology in the design studio. I had found that um, we had incredible tools like vacuum formers, CNC um, machines, and laser cutters that students were that had been invented for prototyping uh, reasons, and students had begun to use those things to as kind of constraints at model scale where they would design, they would make decisions about the height of a model based on whether they could print it in the bed depth of a 3D printer. And so there was this strange um, mix up about what would be a constraint of representation and what would be a, constru a constraint of manufacture. And I was interested in designing a course which would 
um, which would offer a kind of counter position to the use of technology in the class or in the school. And so Between the Sheets is designed to do that. It's called Between the Sheets because the students were asked to use our tools again as prototyping tools and to vacuum form, use CNC machines to make molds and to vacuum form sheets of plastic on those molds. But under the constraints of a manufacturing process that was outside of our, our context. So these are some examples just to let you know what we'll be working on as I lay out the argument of the course of what the students produced. And um, they were asked to design a series of aluminum facade panels that were influenced by um, three technological shifts and also an interest of mine in prototyping and using manufacturing constraints prior to design as opportunities for design. And the technological shifts are, you know, ones I'm sure you all know from um, the shift from curtain wall to rain screen technology. So we're able to make um, panelized systems that no longer have to provide the weather barrier um, of weather barrier of the wall and also don't need to perform structural functions um, with the exception of resisting wind load. Um, and then the second technological shift was the capacity of digital representation to control at a much finer scale the distribution of geometry and for that um, digital drawing to to command um, machines directly. So for that, those drawings to direct machines to do work. So, um, so Between the Sheets attempts to choreograph formal experiments in step with computer-aided manufacturing processes um, such that the two are linked from the outset. When formal experimentation is conducted in step with manufacturing parameters, research finds its way directly into practice. So rather than translating a pre-existing design proposal as a reaction to technical or material constraints after schematic design, which I'd say the Malibu house is that, um, we were interested in manufacturing specifications being embraced before design as agents of design innovation. Um, so I gave the students um, manufacturing constraints um, of an aerospace manufacturer in Southern California. We have, um, you know, 10 to 30 of these kind of um, plants all over Southern California because of the kind of uh, industries that are at work there. And this one in particular is called Superform. It's a company that started in the UK. They did um, the Sainsbury Center in the 70s, but they mostly do um, car parts and, aer and aerospace parts. Here you see um, parts from the Ford GT. Here are parts from a Boeing um, 777. And they do parts with one mold that, that have a lot of geometric demands and um, parts that are that number in the hundreds to the thousands. So if you were doing a mass produced uh, Toyota Prius, you wouldn't be using this technology. But if you were making 200 aircraft, you could use it and it's a kind of economical manufacturing model. Um, they use a thermoforming process. They apply heat and pressure to an aluminum alloy that behaves plastically when it's heated. So the molecules slide past one another and it acts kind of like rubber. Um, on the left is one of their molds, one of their tools, and on the right is the part that tool makes. So I asked my students to produce um, rain screen systems using only one or two parts in order to manage the number of molds that they would need to produce um, and to make a kind of 
to explore an economical model for manufacture that Superform could allow. And that's the, the economics of that also plays out in, in the prototyping exercise because students produce two molds and they reuse those molds to prototype large arrays of their design, um, design projects. And these are some of the mold samples. And then we also, like Superform, had the capacity to post-process our panels. So once we had formed a part, we were able to use our CNC tools to cut the parts. And those paths for cutting could be individualized if, if desired. So because the machine has 100 feet to cut, the shape of that cut can be whatever the designers choose. So for geometric input, the student, I introduced the students to relatively simple tessellation strategies, and we developed a vocabulary, a shared vocabulary for t thinking about those um, techniques. So the, um, I introduced them to plain tiling, which just means you have a unit shape, which when you array it, closes up the surface and there are no longer gaps in the surface. Um, those units were um, defined by what we call the tile boundary. So it's basically just the shape of the perimeter of the unit. Um, we then uh, distributed a series of field line work. So that's geometry that intentionally uh, breaches the boundaries of the unit and tries to draw geometric fields that are at a scale that's different from that of the unit. Um, then all of the students had to keep track of what I called substrate line work. How is this system going to efficiently and predictably connect to um, the, the wall beyond? And the last kind of bit of vocabulary was panel morphology. So what, through what surface are those earlier geometric decisions going to be produced? And in this case, you can see that the surface of the panel is um, undulating in order to keep track of the, of the field line work that crosses it. So um, in this work, aluminum's intrinsic qualities are transformed by extrinsic geometries rendered as these things I described, the panel boundary, the field line work, and the panel morphology. The resulting surfaces present synthetic qualities associated with a range of materials, including wrinkled satin. Oops, oh, darn, I did that wrong, hold on. <laughs> uh, wrinkled satin, carved marble, stretched latex, fluid-filled organic membranes, armor, and cast ceramic. So to kind of walk you through, um, just this is uh, two semesters of teaching this course. Um, so I wanted to walk through some of the invention and the kind of surface effects that the students were able to generate um, really working very seriously with manufacturing constraints. The first one is called satin sheet. This one is a two tile system. It yields 72 standard panel combinations, which can be um, mixed and um, mixed and matched across any given surface. So those 72 uniform fields can be choreographed um, as a variety of local features in a field. The um, dichroic paint finish that the students used heightens the sensation of continual movement that the field line work instigates optically. So the surface recedes and approaches rhythmically as one movement, one's movement alters the surface's color. The field line work progresses linearly, curls, tangles, and moves again depending on the panel orientation and its, its adjacencies. And these are their final prototypes. They're, they range in scale from um, eight, pretty much about eight feet by 10 feet arrays of these panels. 
Um, this one is called Bust a Line. It's a single tile system. There's just one mold and it uses tool inserts during manufacturing to economically produce a field of wild variation. By accepting and emphasizing the tile boundaries, the panel surface raises and lowers in relation to the hexagonal boundary. And at the same time, the hex boundaries are moving forward and becoming more visually pronounced or are receding and becoming lost in what seems to be a, the undulating folds of a carved marble surface. And you can see here where sometimes the panel boundaries get lost in the, in the field of the panel and at other times you get a kind of deep embossing and relief at the tile boundary. This project is called Shiatsu. It takes advantage of the duration of the thermoforming process to modulate air pressure through a series of independent chambers. So these students abandoned all molds and instead invented a device to deliver through chambers um, uh, uh, compartments of air pressure. And because they can do that um, across a square, they're able to change the number and location of features on a series of square tiles to generate a variety of, effect, of effects seen on the lower left. The resultant material resembles latex, which is stretched from behind, and the features kind of rhythmically and unexpectedly emerge. Point Blank is um, a project that actually adopts more than one manufacturing technology in order to um, proliferate part counts. So they were uh, dissatisfied with one or two parts and researched other methods of fabrication which didn't, um, which were less expensive and could do lower amplitude panels. So some of their panels are manufactured through stamping technology and others are manufactured through thermo thermoforming processes. And as a result, they're allowed, they are able to um, modulate the density and amplitude of the tile system by mixing uh, manufacturing strategies. And in this particular iteration of the course, all the students designed um, all of these tricky conditions that we have to deal with as architects, like transitions, folds in a surface, and terminations. And you can see their strategy for dealing with a corner in their, um, in their uh, exhibition. This one is called Tongue in Cheek. It produces um, a, a kind of organic membrane, a quality associated with organic membranes, and it also is able to produce um, undulation and curvature through very small scale um, curvature in two panel types. So one panel has a little bit of convexity, the other a little bit of concavity, and as a result they're able to get double curvature in their array. Um, the other development here is that they actually take the panel morphology and allow it to overlap their panel boundaries. So they produce something that looks like an undercut. It looks impossible to manufacture um, using this technology, but they were quite creative in the way parts were removed from molds and they were able to get these undercut qualities and also disguise tile boundaries by pushing the inside of the tile over over the edge. And you can see here in their array the kind of curvature and undulation they get out of the parts. This one is intestines and roses. The invention here is that the students took the field line work and redrew the tile boundaries so that the tiles become disguised in the similar geometry that's inside the panel field. And, um, you know, the best, the sort of most convincing image of this is in their final um, array where it's really difficult to actually draw out where the edges of the panels are. And they, um, uh, 
heightened the kind of uh, softness and um, and seeming expansion of this surface by painting all of the deep recessed areas a darker shade of red and allowing the more inflated areas, the kind of advancing areas to be a brighter red. Um, this project is called Nurples. I haven't made the disclaimer yet that I named none of these projects, but um, Nurples is quite similar to Intestines and Roses. It also disguises the tile boundary. So you can see that there are a series of um, kind of pixel units inside the tile and the tile boundary is redrawn around those parts and um, their invention or contribution to the class was really to develop a kind of painting strategy and a masking strategy which would allow them to do kind of painterly effects across that surface and the paint color um, didn't align with the panel um, boundaries so they are able to really in a more mosaic way um, produce the color that uh, slides across the field and this is their scheme and the last student project I'll show and then I'll just show you one example of what Superform made for me um, this is a project that's just called panel it's a triangulated system. It uses a kind of polygonal mesh logic to um, design a series of connections that allows them to basically clad anything from a sphere of a particular diameter to um, a concave or convex surface. And these are some of their renderings looking at, you know, how to deal with transitions. And this is their array. So you can see in this view, you're looking toward a convex surface, and in this view, a concave surface. And that's the degree of modulation they can achieve with their connections. And then the last project is just um, a project that my office did for the Matters of Sensation show at Artist Space. And this is one where um, Superform agreed to make about 50 panels using one mold and using um, um, a kind of fabrication chamber who, that they had already. So I had some constraints of one mold and an 18 by 18 panel. And um, I produced a series of kind of three-part hexagonal um, uh, ovoid masses that kind of a slump in a variety of directions and they they modulate tone with a series of kind of surface features and I was uh, trying to see how I could actually embed units within the unit boundary as a way to try to um, uh, disguise the fact that I only had one tile and in this case in certain views these are kind of production views of it in certain views, you can see that there's a kind of organic quality to the masses because each, there are six degrees of rotational freedom. So you get sort of, un, you can't really read the logic for how the masses get distributed and the quality is, um, is organic as a result. You can't read the math of the system except at its boundary. So I feel like I talked too long, that's it. I think in different projects, the specifics shift. Um, uh, in ex 
I think I could be specific about the D Cafe, for example. It's an auditorium space where um, the um, where there you the the configuration of the felt sheets moves from being presenting their actual material conditions. So at certain edges, you just see a thin, you know, three eighths inch piece of felt. But at certain transitions, like between um, lines of felt or at the ceiling or the floor, all of the edges of that sheet are, are turned away from one's view. So when you look at the wall, the experience of that surface moves from looking like a mass to looking like a thin surface. And I think as architects, we have the ability to, through vision, modulate what part of our uh, ge what part of our geometric distribution people are seeing and how that relates to different topologies. So sometimes I think you can really play games doing that. You can either uh, make things appear thinner than they might be um, in relation to what they are just beyond that thin edge or you can make them appear thicker than what they are and I think we manipulate sense by kind of playing that game about exactly what is our viewer looking at. Um, and in different cases, it's about whether you're kind of foregrounding line work or you're foregrounding surface or you're foregrounding mass. And I'd say that's kind of how we do it. The second part of that answer is that because we have such control over distributions of geometry, we can make things that are rigid, I mean, they're rigidly constructed, but they look soft because we're presenting the geometries affiliated with softness to our viewer. Um, I was just in the CoLab over at the warehouse and there were cubic stools that look incredibly rigid but you touch them and they're soft and so I think we can play with whether our ge geometric description aligns with materiality or intentionally slips from it and those are ways in which I see like in the loco roco game that even if we don't touch the materiality of something, or we can't confirm it with touch, we can experience it with our eye. And I think it's just in how geometries um, are distributed. It's, it's very good to see the work, and it's, it's very, very beautiful. And I do like this notion of the slippage. It's, very, it's like the notion of that downy um, uh, fabric soft slow motion and the deflection of the towel mm -hmm. gives the impression of softness, which is great. It's a brilliant so commercial slip. <laughs> um, but thinking about your house, I'm thinking about the Taurus house and mm -hmm. the ways in which you needed to figure out how to clad something which could take the deflections of the surface. And then looking at the, the tiling exercises, mm -hmm. have you begun to think about the way that these surface explorations could also feed into the notion of sheathing, scales, uh, the kind of um, surface treatment that you find in shingling, mm -hmm. for instance, in the house. Mm -hmm. um, in some design work in the studio, my students have been working on that problem. I mean, I think in my, my professional work, I'm dealing with so many forces that I can't always push the research that's happening at, in the academy directly into that. So I'm, I'm kind of dealing with different interests all at the same time. I, I, I think that in that house there was, in the Taurus house, the Malibu house, there was the desire to use lapping shingles and, um, to, and to form those things to produce these other a more th a thicker cladding strategy. But that was always very schematically um, rendered. And we never, because the structural system was s really tough to actually resolve, we never really fully developed the cladding system. So I would say that right now I have 
kind of patterning and cladding research and I have volumetric research and I haven't really brought those two things together. There's always been an interesting conversation about um, if you have fabric effects in this rain screen system, how does your mass scene get rethought in relation to that? And that's not something I've directly done, but I'm sliding them closer together. So right now I'm uh, teaching a class on, on developing massing strategies with fabric. And so I'm tr taking all of this, the problem of changing surface area and trying to understand it at the scale of massing. But I need that two more steps before I can figure out how to push them together, I think. Thank you.